Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with, by popular demand, the best and worst Mahler Symphony cycles in a box. Cycles, complete cycles complete in other words at least symphonies one through nine possibly a bit of the tenth possibly Das Lied von der Erde Das Lied von der Erde I mean let's do it right Das Lied von der Erde possibly other Mahler stuff depending on the box but at least symphonies one through nine the numbered ones and probably the Adagio of number 10. It, there are a million of these things now. It used to be so simple. Life was so simple. It used to be there was Bernstein, there was Schulte, there was Heitink as an import if you were not living in the United, if you were living in the United States, that is, and Kubelik, and that was Mahler. That was it by the 70s. That was, you had four choices, basically. Oh, God, it was wonderful. Now I have here at least... 22 complete cycles, and it's not all of them that are out there, and there's some I don't have sitting here. And I find it staggering and it kind of irritating in a way because the exponential expansion and metastization, metastasization of Mahler performances has not been an unmitigated boon. There are too many Mahler cycles out there. There is too much Mahler. Too much of it is mediocre. And in the process, Mahler has ceased to become something special and exciting and thrilling and new. And it's become just another day at the symphony. Oh, gosh, that irritates me. So I've been bitching. I'm going to continue bitching. But we're going to get through a lot of music. And I need to move rather rapidly because... This is going to be a long one, folks. I'm telling you. I mean, they're long symphonies, and you have 20-some-odd cycles. So I, I put them here in clumps, because clumping them together is actually a rather easy way to get through large quantities of discs. So let's start here. Let me see. I'm going to look at the clumps. Here's a clump. Let's look at this clump. This is the clump of Mahler, Mahler cycles that really suck. These sucky clumps, let's call it. We're going to start with the sucky clumps because, uh, you know, they do and we need to hear them. This is Lauren Mazel with the Philharmonia. This is his second complete Mahler cycle. His first was on Sony with the Vienna Philharmonic. Now that featured a few good performances. You know, number two wasn't bad. Number four was outstanding. Absolutely outstanding with Kathleen ba Battle singing the soprano solo. Six was pretty good. It really was. And the rest of them, yeah, you could just toss. Already in that performance, Mazel was showing a disconcerting propensity for Celebedachian slow tempos. Like the first movement of the Third Symphony it took like 40 minutes. It was endless. Endless. Well, here it's all worse. It's all incredibly, incredibly, incredibly slow. Basically, that's all you need to know about it. It's just, it's just mannered and ridiculous and narcissistic and mm, nah, not. Also, a sucky Mahler cycle. Simon Rattle, yeah, yeah. Simon Rattle, who was getting rave after rave after rave after rave in Gramophone magazine. People were trying desperately, the English critics, to convince us that this guy knew what he was doing in Mahler. His performances are thoroughly second rate. They are bereft of useful ideas. The orchestra is second rate, except here he remade some with the Berlin Philharmonic, and a couple of those are in here. Let's see, with, with let's see, you get number one has the extra Blumina movement attached to it at some point. And I think, what is it, number five, or what is it, was Berlin Phil? You have, let's say, five and 10. Of course, Rattle did do a good 10th. I'll give him that. The Cook version of the 10th. He did it twice. One with Bournemouth, not City of Birmingham, was before he was in Birmingham, and one with uh, Berlin. And they are excellent. They really are. They're some of his best work. And and let's see, the Berlin Phil and let's, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think five is with Berlin and a couple others. I don't care. 
they're 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 equally uninteresting. It doesn't matter who he's doing it with. Rattle is she is you know hitched his bus to the Mahler bandwagon, and the salivating, drooling British musical establishment immediately turned their brains and ears off and told everyone they were the best thing since sliced bread. And they're not. And they're not. I mean, they may not be quite as horrible as some of the other horrible ones I'm talking about. They're just uninteresting, resolutely uninteresting. And the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, let's face it, was not a great symphony orchestra. One of the things that we will find as we go through these symphonies is that Mahler is playable now by everybody. So everybody's doing it. But there is still a world of difference between a top tier, world class, first rank ensemble and all of these other merely good groups that can also play Mahler. And they may be very proud of themselves because they can also play Mahler, but uh, that's no excuse for making a record. All right, so that's that. Then we get the all-time worst ever Mahler cycle, which I did a whole separate video on, but I have to mention it. It's Svetlanov with, you know, the USSR large radio, symphony, television, broadcast, state, symphony, federation, Russian symphony, orchestra thing. And oh my God, oh my God, they are horribly played, miserably recorded, and interpreted with a mindless disregard for what the music wants to do that is truly cosmically staggering. So, Svetlanov, oh God, terrible. It's so bad you'll want to hear it if you like Mahler, just to prove that like such a thing exists. So those are all the bad ones. The really, the ones you should just not bother with. All the rest of these are good or bad in various proportions. And a lot of them are, are just kind of, you know, uninteresting. They never should have been done because, you know, nowadays an orchestra wants to do a Mahler cycle and because it's, it's trendy and it puts them on the map and they find a label and it's financed, they pay for it. And it's the inmates running the asylum. You know, the people who really have no business doing this stuff, uh, allowing the public to hear what they're doing. And they like it. And some of it's prestigious, I understand. And some of it, is, it might be nice as a souvenir of a live concert in a provincial town somewhere in Europe. But to compete with the big, the big boys? No, 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 no. And let's not kid ourselves. Just, just not. It's just silly. Silly to pretend. So uh, I'm not going to pretend. I'm, I'm not into pretending. Let's look at the ones now that are, oh, I'm just so hard to choose. See, modern, modern versions that are varying degrees of good by a lesser known, well, not lesser known. I don't even know how to describe these. I put them together. That's how I describe them. First, Bamberg Symphony with Jonathan Knott. This is definitely a Knott. Some of these performances aren't bad. Most of them are completely unnecessary. These have also gotten some rave reviews coming out and I put them on and I just go, what are these people thinking? Haven't they done any real comparative listening? Bambergers are decent, not fabulous. Not is decent, not fabulous. I, I, I find this whole, whole, whole set to be wholly, wholly unnecessary. I really do. Not terrible, but certainly not outstanding in any particular way. Next, in a similar category, David Zinman with the Tone Hollow Orchestra of Zurich. Now, the Tone Hollow Orchestra of Zurich has come a long way, but since the back of the day type, you know, period, they play very well. Zinman is a very capable conductor, and these performances have, again, there are good moments and bad moments, and I know it's very shallow not to get into the deep details of each individual performance, but I've reviewed most of these on classicstoday.com as I have some of the Jonathan Knott versions. And you can read what I say there if you're curious. It's not bad. It's an SACD sound, some of which is very good. The eighth is pretty good in here. There's some fine performances. There really, really, really are. But as a set, does it make an impression? Is it big and bold and important and malarian and gripping and moving and no, it's not. So we don't need that one. Also, a big disappointment to me was Marcus Stenz on Ohms. Now, Stenz did a fabulous, fabulous, 
Fifth Symphony with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. It's on like ABC Classics and you can get it for like $2. I talked about it in my video in the Mahler 5. And he started to, he also did a Mahler 2 with them, by the way, which wasn't as good, but it was still pretty good. Then he started to, to develop a reputation as a Mahler guy. And he went to Cologne, the Gersenich Orchestra of Köln, and immediately whipped off a Mahler cycle. Why? What, what, what gives this guy the right to do that? I mean, he did a great Mahler fifth. He should have retired after the great Mahler fifth. Some of these, again, they're not bad. Does he know the style? Yeah, he knows the style. But goodness gracious, what, what motivates these people to all of a sudden do a cycle in like five minutes? It's, it's all of a sudden it appears like miraculously, like Athena springing whole from the head of Zeus. And you've got this whole Mahler cycle all of a sudden, and it's, it's just thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly mediocre. Just mediocre. Nothing else to say about it. Another senseless Mahler cycle. Now, here is one orchestra-sponsored Mahler project which is not senseless. It was not. It's really actually quite good in many spots. This is Michael Tilson Thomas with the San Francisco Symphony. Now, this is called something like the Mahler Project. Yes, the Mahler Project, the Mahler Procedure, like a hysterectomy. It's a procedure. It's a it's a something. And you get in here uh, symphonies one through nine, the Adagio for number 10, the Kindertone Leader, a fantastic Das Klagende Lied, really the best one for Das Klagende Lied. It's marvelous. And uh, some songs with orchestra, some variety of Diskenab and von der Horn and other things. And the Rückert Leader with piano and Das Lied von der Erde. And these are, you know, taken live. And, you know, sonically they are, they're hit and miss, at least as far as SACD surround sound goes. They sound better in regular stereo. But they're very good performances by and large. For the most part, they're extremely well done. You know, Tilson Thomas can be a little bit mannered. He can get a little bit self-indulgent when it comes to this music and, and a little fussy. I remember seeing the first symphony live where he was making a big deal out of the difference between fortissimo and forte cymbal strokes. I mean, you know, you, you should hear a difference, obviously, but it shouldn't be so wide that you're saying to yourself, hmm, why are they trying so hard not to be fortissimo? You know, in a loud context, it doesn't work. Anyway, that's the kind of thing. And also I saw him do the fifth with an adagietto that was just interminable and kind of embarrassing, <laughs> you know, in terms of the way he milked it. And so there's a little milking going on here. You know, he's got his hands on both teats um, in some of the lyrical passages, but there are some fabulous, fabulous first-class performances. He always did a great seventh. The fourth is marvelous. I, uh, you know, this, the resurrection is really very, very good. These are these are good performances, and San Francisco is a great orchestra. So this is worth having. Uh, it's expensive if you can still find it. I don't even know if it's still available. Probably for the orchestra, but there's some really wonderful stuff in here, and you should get the dust clog of the lead. You really should. So that's the best of that clump. Now the next clump. This is the clump of I don't know. I would call them maybe nostalgia Mahler or Mahler that by people who who really have have what it takes and did some really good work, but for some reason either the orchestra wasn't entirely there or the sonics aren't entirely there, but there are some wonderful things. And you have to admire them for their pluck, for their courage, for their for their doing it under circumstances where other people just probably wouldn't. And the first of those has to be Maurice Abravanel with the Utah Symphony. Now, Abravanel, as you know, did just unbelievably wide-ranging repertoire and was an incredibly musical and interesting guy. This is Mahler a little bit stripped down. The Utah Symphony was not a great orchestra. He doesn't take repeats in the first movement of the first or the sixth. You know, wherever he can, he leaves them out. But there is a freshness to these performances that is quite affecting. It really is. The, uh, some of them are, uh, the, the fourth is one of the great ones. Absolutely one of the great performances of the fourth, not least because you have Natanya Davroth singing the finale better than anyone ever has. It's just, it's just tremendous. He did very well with the second symphony, which has the young Beverly Sills in the teeny, teeny, tiny soprano role. 
I mean, no one buys Mahler II for the soprano role. The third is also a very fine performance, even though the trumpets in the coda of the first movement crack horribly. It's, you know, it's a little bit embarrassing. And, but also great is the eighth. This is one of the really fine eighths. It's a fantastic eighth, mostly because it's, it's swift and it uses just huge, huge choral forces. And they set up the microphones and just let it rip, which is how you have to do the eighth. The more you monkey with it, the more you try and be expressive, the more you interfere, the worse it's going to sound. Conducting the eighth is like being a traffic cop. As I said, you're just directing traffic. Get up there, make sure everyone does what they're supposed to do, and the music just takes care of itself. It's marvelous. And this is really a very, very good eighth. Shockingly good. So that, you know, yeah, Brabanel is, 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 is fun. He's worth considering. And also, it, you know, he's unpretentious. He's just innocently musical and having a good time. And that comes through. It really does. Not great. I'm not kidding. I'm not making exaggerated claims for it. I don't want to, because that would be selling Mahler short. There are many finer performances, but those are nice. You, 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 like, you like them. They're like a friendly neighbor. You know what I mean? Next, let's see. Václav Neumann with the Czech Philharmonic. Now, like so many people who did Mahler symphonies, uh, Mahler sets, these are compromised by the fact that Neumann did a bunch of Mahler symphonies in gorgeous digital sound that were recorded by Pony Canyon in Japan. And he and they were better than these. He did he did a really fine second symphony, and uh, there were a couple others. I think there was a ninth, and uh, who knows where they are now. But this set, the super fun set, has some outstanding performances in it as well. It has a marvelous third, a very very fine eighth, um, and elsewhere are some very strange tempos, very strange tempos. Oh, he also remade the sixth really, really well. This sixth has a hammer blow that sounds like an odd metallic plink. I don't know what that is. And the seventh has like this excruciatingly slow second knocked music. There's some, some odd choices in here. And the fifth has a, a version of the score that I'm not quite sure what it is. At least the timpani part's totally rewritten in places, or the guy gets lost one or the other. But it's it's just a, a um, mixed bag. A very mixed bag, but the third and the eighth are digital recordings, late recordings, and they're really, really fine. I enjoy them very much. The third also has some textural peccadillos, which I talk about in my discussion of the third symphony. So there's Neumann, hit and miss, but again, the Czech Philharmonic is such a wonderful orchestra. It's kind of lovable. It's, you know, you, you love it anyway, in spite of its faults. Warts and all, as they say. Definitely a wart and all guy. Tenstedt. Now, this Mahler cycle, the Tenstedt Mahler cycle, has was really, really hit and miss. And again, it's undermined by the fact that there's so much live Tenstedt out there that's arguably better than his studio recordings. Now, his Mahler too is always fantastic, and this is wonderful. But there are also a couple live ones out on the LPO label that are even better. Yeah, it's just wonderful. His eighth is also beautiful. It was done with smaller forces. They made a big deal about it. It doesn't sound small. It sounds fresh. And that's what you want. It's just it's just great. Now, in addition to this stuff, there are his live recordings that are not on the LPO label, but they were released on EMI. And they are live recordings of, let's see, number five, six, and seven. And these are are what we call smokers in the business. Not so much seven, but five and six. Holy cow, they are just hard on sleeve, let it all hang out, emotional hand ringers, you know, like this, you know what I mean? They are really exceptional. And and as as live events, there's bad playing, there are mistakes, there's all kinds, there's bad playing mistakes in most of these performances. Tenstedt was not a disciplinarian. Tenstedt, the LPO was always a little slovenly. And that comes through here also. Also, the, the, 
the formal cycle that he did um, that was released initially was done in the early days of EMI digital recordings. And some of them, like the fourth particularly, uh, and uh, they just didn't sound good. That was true of Rattle's cycle too. My God, his seventh just sounded atrocious. The live ones, some of these just don't sound that good. But again, Tenstedt was one of those guys who had tremendous warmth and communicativeness. And so you love him anyway. You forgive him his faults. So those are the three, I think. I think that's a nice category, actually. A Bravenel, Neumann, and Tenstedt. The Mahler cycles whose faults you forgive. But they are not the best, and we can't say that they are. Now I want to talk about three cycles. One, two, three. Yes, three cycles that I don't have sitting beside me. I do have them. They're in huge boxes and they're spread out. And I say, I'm not, I'll just talk about them. And they are also um, in the okay in moments, but not great in moments sort of universe. First is Sinopoli. Now, Sinopoli began his life. This is with the Philharmonia. Sinopoli began life with a Mahler 5. It's on Deutsche Grammophon. It was really, really good. Everybody liked it. So then, of course, he went on and made a whole cycle. And oh, my goodness, what a strange thing that turned out to be. First of all, he also was not much of a disciplinarian. You would think he would have been better at it. There are terrible mistakes in the playing throughout these cycles that are really rather disturbing. I mean, especially right at the beginning of the first movement, of the finale, pardon me, of the seventh. Ugh, it's a mess. And some of these things, I mean, he didn't care, evidently. But he alternated between extraordinary decadence and self-indulgence, as in his performance of the sixth, which is really sounds like the Baird three pieces for orchestra. I mean, you can see him doing it, and it's kind of intriguing. But there's that, and then there's just rather plain spoken, cool, well played, but no particular, no particular personality at all, like numbers two and three, for example. So Sinopoli was all over the place, and it's not, it's not a cycle that I think has a great deal to recommend it. It's either very, very weird or very, very uninteresting. So that's Sinopoli. Next, we have Schulte. Now, Schulte was another one who did so much extra Mahler that what you get in a box isn't going to have the best stuff he did because his LSO Mahler performances, particularly of numbers 1, 2, and 9, are vastly superior than anything he did later in Chicago. In Chicago, basically, the, the best performances are 5, 6, and 8. Those are really good. So between those two, you get six out of nine symphonies. He was he was never much in number four. He he was you know the Chicago Seventh had its admirers because it was fast and loud and and it is, and uh, you know, I, I I his third was always dreadful. So Schulte is another one of those hit and miss Mahler guys, and and so there's no box of Schulte that I would recommend. And last but not least in the in the cycles that I don't have sitting here in a box in front of me is Abado. Now Abado, he just kept recording the same shit over and over and over and over. And it, sometimes it was better and sometimes it wasn't. He did some mar marvelous Mahler, but in order to put it together, you'd have to you'd have to go for. Uh, there is no Abado Mahler great Mahler cycle in a box. There isn't. There isn't. His best first was his Berlin one. Uh, his second, no, he never really got the second particularly well. He never really got the third particularly well. Some people liked his Vienna fourth with, with Frederica von Stade, uh, or von Stade, actually, since she's from Paramus, New Jersey. I, I, you know, I can take it or leave it. Five was, was, was never his forte. Six, he did pretty well in Berlin and in Chicago. Those are both good performances. They really are. And, and actually, I should revise that. His Chicago second was also pretty good. None of his later ones were better. If you want him in the second, the, the um, Chicago one is the way to go. So where were we? Six, seven, uh, Berlin, not terrible. Eight, forget it, was awful. Nine, his Berlin one is pretty good. Then he remade a bunch of them in Lucerne. And some people love the Lucerne Festival Orchestra. I don't. I know they're full of famous first desk players and all that. That does not make a great orchestra. It does not. A great orchestra happens over decades of committed, 
ensemble playing to develop cohesive balances and textures and however compelling uh, a conductor Abado was, uh, he was basically fussy and micromanagey, and I don't find his Lucerne performances to be terribly persuasive. I know others do. And there seems to be a whole school of hagiographic Abado people out there who just who just worship the guy. A lot of them are in Italy, but not surprisingly, I suppose. And he was a very saintly person, apparently, and very sweet and modest and unassuming and all that. And I'm sure he was just lovely. But his Mahler was really hit and miss. So uh, I, I don't recommend, recommend the Abato Mahler box, which has none of the Chicago stuff. It's mostly Berlin and I think a little Lucerne. I don't know. I have it. It's all split up in different boxes in various places. Too much of a headache, not worth it, and you can do better. So now we come to one, two, three, four boxes of Mahler symphonies that I think have a lot going for them. They aren't perfect. They have their hits and their misses, but they have a lot of genuine Mahler stuff. And so they're better than the last swing and a miss group that I talked about. First, Kubelik. Now, Kubelik's Mahler box also is compromised by the fact that Aldita has an almost complete Mahler cycle with Kubelik live. And this is the kind of stuff that makes you crazy. And, you know, I, you, you, many of you asked me, they said, do a talk on Mahler cycles. And I said, I'm not doing cycles because none of them are perfect. None of them. Uh, there aren't any that are perfect. And, and I, I, you know, and for that reason, one of the reasons is because that makes this so difficult is that you find repeats of the same pieces by the same conductors that are better than the ones in the box. And a lot of these Aldita recordings of Kubelik Live are better than the ones in the box. And there's a fantastic Das Lied von der Erde on Aldita. So, you know, there, you, you have to pick and choose. But this Bavarian Radio Mahler cycle has wonderful things in it. First of all, his first is the reference recording of the first. Second, terribly underplayed. Third, wonderful, bucolic, very Czech sounding performance with forward woodwinds. I really like it. Fourth, excellently done. Excellently done with, again, marvelous woodwind detail. The fifth is very quick and I think very effective. Sixth, underplayed. Seventh, underplayed. Eighth, underplayed. Ninth, I like this ninth. I really like this ninth. It's again, it's lean and, and tight and, and Kubelik would be much more expansive later in his career, but it's, it's, it's pretty good. And it's, it's consistent. This is a, a genuine, important musical personality with a view of the music that is consistently expressed throughout the cycle. And that counts for something because even in the performances that are less persuasive, if you like the approach, you'll probably enjoy them too, even if you'll have better individual versions of those symphonies by other people. So Kubelik is worth thinking about. High Tink. Now, High Tink is the most aggravating Mahler conductor who ever lived. Why? I've said this many times. Because he gave an interview in Gramophone Magazine where he said Mahler symphonies are special and there are too many Mahler recordings and too many Mahler performances and one should not do them too frequently. And then he went and became the worst offender with too frequent Mahler performances. Now, his first Mahler cycle, he hasn't done in integral Mahler cycles after this one. He did individual symphonies multiple, multiple, multiple times with every orchestra he got his hands on and they've all been recorded and it just was a stupid waste of time. It really wasn't even fair to any of us. But this cycle, with the, the early Concertabel cycle, let's call it, has wonderful performances. Now, the first symphony, the early one, was not the best. He remade the first in Amsterdam before the digital era, and it's, it's just wonderful. Then he did number two and three in here are just great. Uh, four is hit and miss, although I like the earlier one better than his digital one that came later. And then let's see, five is not very well played. Six is really underplayed. Seven is fantastic. Just to hear the sound of the Concerto Bell in those days. It's a very straightforward, no-nonsense performance that has 
just incredibly beautiful sonorities. It's wonderfully, wonderfully paced. It's terrific. The eighth is very small scale. It's very pretty, but it's just very small scale. And I like this ninth very much. The ninth has wonderful, wonderful playing. And as usual with these recordings, it was before Phillips learned how to put bass in their recordings. So they're a little shallow sounding, but it's, it's a sound like no other sound. And it's an echt Mahler sound because Mahler is, they know they're Mahler in Amsterdam, in Holland generally. And, and I, I, so I, I enjoy this early Heiting cycle as much for the orchestra as for the conductor. And because the, the really good performances in here are absolutely fabulous, fabulous, fabulous performances. Two, three, seven, nine, just great. Absolutely great. So Heiting is worth considering. Also for the personality he brings to it, or the orchestra brings to it. And then we get, ah, yes, Pierre Boulez. Now this box has other, other Mahler things in it. He did Das Lied von der Erde, ugh, not so well. He did Das Klage der Lied, ugh, not so well. That's not, that's in here too. Yes, it is in here. And he did all the songs. And uh, I don't know, for some reason, he, he, he was also very hit and miss in Mahler. He really was. The surprise in this box is the first. Because you wouldn't think as young Mahler, it's passionate, it's spontaneous. You wouldn't think Boulez would do that well. But he really does. It's with Chicago. It's just great. It's really great. So the first is very good. The second is okay. The third gets away from him, frankly. The fourth, mm, I like it. I liked it. It's good. It's, it's, it's with Cleveland. And I like Cleveland. So there you go. Five people liked a lot. I think it's a good, solid performance. Six, you would think he would do better than he does. Seven is weird. Seven is icy cool and sort of deconstructionist. It's with the Cleveland Orchestra, and which is a good orchestra to do that with. And I, I, I like that seventh. A lot of people hated it, just hated it. The eighth is another. It's a piece Boulez should never do. He did it. I, I mean, I saw him do it live. I don't know why he bothered. I, I just don't. And and the ninth is quite good. Quite good. So Boulez, but Boulez is Boulez. You know, people people think he had he had his way of doing things. Let's put it that way. And as he got older and as a composer, he was evident he was more and more of a failure and that his inspiration had dried up. He turned more and more to conducting and he became sort of a grand old man. He became everything that he despised when he was younger. He became the symbol of the, the musical infrastructure that we kind of take for granted. His performances originally were famous because he was very cold and very clinical and very modernist, but his Mahler is not that way all the time. It is most that way in the seventh, and, and elsewhere, he could just be a little bit cold and I think possibly disinterested. I'm not sure how much he really cared about all of the music, uh, but about some of the music he cared quite a bit and some of the performances are quite fine. So Boulez is out there, I'm just telling you. He's not my favorite really in, in, in anything, except maybe that first is just great, it's a shocker. But it's, it's well done. He was at least a guy who generally got very, very high standards and worked with the best orchestras. So, so that, that standard is there as well. Next, here's a cycle that may, may surprise you. Azawa with Boston. Now Azawa also has done more Mahler than is contained in this box. <sighs> there was an early first, which I like better than the one in here on Deutsche Gramophone, that included the Blumina movement. It's fabulous. It's one of the great first symphonies. It's wonderful. It's in the Boston Symphony box, you know, or the Azawa box, or you know, one of those boxes. And it's just, just terrific. But there are some fabulous things in here. They really are. This first is also very, very good, very fresh, very unfussy and direct and lively and beautifully played. Number two, it's a bit underplayed. And Azawa did a remake with the Saito Kinun Orchestra for Sony, which is one of the great ones. It's absolutely fantastic. And that's what annoys me about these. I keep coming back to the same point. When these people do this stuff so many times, so many times, and then you have a box and you can say, well, wait a minute, you can get the same symphony with the same guy better. 
somewhere else. That's why I hesitate to do the boxes. The third here is fabulous. The fourth, eh, so-so. The fifth, quite good. The sixth, it's live and it's badly recorded. It's a shame because it's a very, very good performance, but it has a real cutoff in the treble and it's dull sounding, which is really a pity. Seven is quite good. Seven is fabulously played. I just wish there were more clangy, noisy, bellsy things at the very end, but it's a very, very good performance. The eighth is that is live, and and it was done sort of at the same time as that great Schoenberg Gura leader, but it wasn't as successful. It's a little bit underplayed. It's well sung. It's enjoyable to listen to. It's kind of like high tinks in that sense, you know, because it's it's not bombastic. It's 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 very pleasant. But if you want the heavens to open when you hear the eighth, eh, that's not your guy. The ninth is fantastic. And he did another great ninth with Saito Keenan again on Sony Classical in Japan. Azawa does a great Mahler ninth. There are wonderful, wonderful things in here. And he balances the piece so beautifully between the slightly underplayed first movement and then the real let it all hang out adagio finale gorgeous, gorgeous performance. And he really plays the inner movements with wonderful attention to detail and point and crispness. And that's just, just, just great. Absolutely great. So this is a lot better than people give him credit for. Don't count out Azawa, tell you, as a Mahler conductor. He had no reputation for it. And uh, he deserves some serious credit. But we're not quite at the however moment. But I now have one, two, three, four, five, well, four and a half, shall we say, Mahler cycles, which are my faves, my absolute faves. They are really, really good and, and among the best. First, we must mention Bernstein. How do they go? This way. Bernstein. Now, what is the problem with Bernstein? The problem with Bernstein is that when Bernstein was hot, nobody did Mahler better ever. And between Deutsche Grammophon and Sony, you can put together the greatest Mahler cycle in the history of Mahler cycles. There is no question about it. None whatsoever. Absolutely Zippo. I just think that um, it takes a little doing because neither is perfect. And where they fail, sometimes they fail. All right, so let's look at the the Sony one. Now, there, the Sony one is a little larger also because there are a couple versions of the Second Symphony. This box has his New York Philharmonic one, which is better than his one with the London Symphony that he did later. It's better sounding, too, by a mile. It's not as great as this one. <sighs> However, so let's start at the beginning. Number one, very, very good, but uh, well, we'll get to the buts. Number two, it's good, but the recording, and it's better sounding than his later one, but the recording is still odd. Like, cymbals are off mic. How could you have cymbals off mic in Mahler 2? Why? Very exciting performance, though. Number three, reference recording. Number four, reference recording. Number five, failure. <laughs> Big failure. I don't know what happened in number five. It, it, it was an early one. Everyone is just a little bit off. Timpani get lost in the scared so is really kind of annoying. It's not terrible, but it's, it's you know. Six, fabulous. Seven, reference recording. Eight, the best one Bernstein did because it's the only one that was made under controlled conditions is with the London Symphony, and it represents his vision of the eighth very well, and it moves. It's, you know, it's just so funny how many people who do the eighth, they bog down in the second movement, particularly when you get to like the trio of the three irritating women, I mean, this is, he never does. He gets it. He knows how the music has to move. It's that simple. Nine, um, a little rough and ready playing wise, but I think it's a great night. It's raw. It's passionate. It's, it has a quick finale, quick adagio finale, which I think is kind of cool. So, and in this particular cheap, cheap box, this is the cheap box. It's all the New York Philharmonic stuff. And you get Das Lied von der Erde. Of course, they could have put in Diskanab and Wunderhorn, which they should have. They could have put in the Song Cycles, which they should have. They should have put in the Diskanab and Wunderhorn piano version with Ludwig and Barry and Bernstein. I mean, they should have done all those things. They didn't. But it's really very, very good. However, however, this is a little however, not the however. 
you have this cycle, which is very strong, where this cycle is not, generally speaking. In other words, great number one, great number two. I prefer number three here, but this is a great number three. Number four, mm -mm. you want this one. This is the one with the boy soprano in the finale. And I, that was a mistake. It's not that there's anything wrong with Helmut Wittek or whatever his name is who sings it. It was just not a good idea. It was an experiment, okay? Failed experiment. Number five, fabulous with Vienna Phil, and it's really good sounding. It was recorded, I believe, in the Alta Opera in Frankfurt live, and it's it's one of the best sounding of all these DG recordings. Number six with the Vienna Philharmonic, the most harrowing, gut wrenching, fabulous six you'll ever hear in your life. Number seven, it's New York Phil. It's fantastic. I was at these performances; they were marvelous. But this one, this one is sui generis. It was the one that told us what a masterpiece the seventh was. So what can you do? Um, eighth, it's that live one from Salzburg Festival or something like that. It's it's very similar interpretively to this, but um, it's 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 messy and live. And you know they only released it because Bernstein died before he could do a studio or new live remake. Number nine is with the Concertgebouw. It's also very very fine, um, rather lean in sonority. Some people prefer his Berlin Philharmonic Ninth that was released after he died, which is horrible and has all kinds of bad playing and sloppy neurotic tempo things and the trombones missing at the climax of the Adagio, which very few people noticed when it came out. And frankly, I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I was one of the few who did and started yelling about how the Bernstein never would have permitted this thing to be released. So, if you want a more modern sounding ninth with a very slow adagio, then this is going to be uh, your baby. And of course, there is a Bernstein Mahler cycle on video, the Vienna Philharmonic. Let's not forget that. Oh my goodness. Frankly, I don't find any of those performances to be more potent than the ones that you find in these sets. So I don't worry about the videos. But the problem is you have to get two boxes if you want to have the great Bernstein Mahler cycle, which is annoying. It's just annoying. You have to do it that way. Next, Bertini. If you can find this Mahler cycle, you should get it. This, I have always said, is the most consistently fine of all the Mahler cycles out there. There is not a single performance that falls below the same exceptional level of execution and penetrating interpretive intelligence intelligence they are all good are they the best well that's the issue isn't it they're better recordings of number two better recordings i think this is me i have number five better recordings of six you know there's it's all about comparisons but this is one hell of an achievement you get it also das lied von der erde the ninth is fantastic one of the eight great eighths i mean this is you know, along with Anthony Vitt on Naxos, this is the other eighth to get. It's fantastic. This is an eighth where the heavens do open at the end. It's just exceptional, absolutely exceptional. And the sound on these things is just fantastic. And for some reason, it comes and goes in the catalog. It really does. I don't think it's available at present. Maybe it'll show up again soon. Maybe it's available somewhere. I don't know. But the Bertini Mahler cycle is the most consistently fine of all the Mahler cycles. There are no weak performances in it, even if you may prefer others, you know, for their individual merits more than some of these. So don't overlook it if you can get it at a reasonable price, of course. I hope it comes back. I hope Warner releases it cheap or something. They really should. So that's Bertini. Next, Gillen. Michael Gielen, oh, what a great Mahler conductor Michael Gielen is. See, Michael, Michael Gielen always struck me as sort of what Boulez ought to be because he was a composer, but Gielen really got into the all the darkness and the expressionist angst and emotional hysteria that was Mahler in a way that Boulez never could. And so this cycle, which is now from SWR, it was originally on Hensler. First of all, this is the most complete of all the Mahler boxes you'll ever find. You get all nine symphonies, you get the Cook version of number 10, you get Des Knaben von der Horn, you get all the major song cycles, you get Das Lied von der Erde. I mean, it's really, really, really complete. And the performances are absolutely fantastic. Some, of course, are better than others. The weak links for me are, are four, 
five, and very surprisingly for me, nine, which is, is to me rather underplayed. All the others are fantastic. One is great, two is great, three is great, six is an expressionist nightmare, as it should be. Seventh is a reference recording as fine as Bernstein's. It's the most slithery, uh, wonderfully, wonderfully um, sort of nihilistic version of the seventh that you'll ever hear. I mean, Gielen relishes every ugly twist and turn of the music. It's just fantastic. The eighth is surprisingly fine. You wouldn't think that Gielen would get into a piece of music that's totally happy for the most part anyway. You know, Gielen wanted misery. He loved misery. He loved nihilism. He loved despair. He loved existentialist hysteria. And he does a really good Mahler 8. It's a surprise. And the sound is really top notch for most of this cycle. And the other things, I mean, it's a great Mahler 10. Of course, he also did this clog and delete, and I did a little talk about that, but that's on Orfeo. It's not in here because it's on Orfeo. He did it in Vienna. Oh, well. Still, an absolutely great Mahler cycle, and you cannot go wrong. However, however, we are now somewhat like 45 minutes into this, and it's time to wrap it up. If I had to pick, if I had to pick a a basic one box Mahler cycle that has really no weak well <laughs> again again what am I supposed to say practically no weak performances I would choose and here we are shy mostly with the concerto although not entirely this is fantastic it is the Concertgebouw, that wonderful orchestra with possibly the greatest Mahler tradition of any of them, and that includes Vienna. It's just amazing, absolutely amazing, and the performances are wonderful. One is fantastic. Two, I wasn't so impressed, especially with that strange offstage Urlicht kind of thing that he does. I found two to be a little fussy. Three is wonderful. Four is fabulous. Five is terrific. Six is Wow, just great with woodwind playing that's to die for. Seventh, that's the one where they found that that Mahler tympano that he had specially constructed to play the low Ds or whatever note they were in, in the finale. And you really hear it. It's a very, very fine performance. Eight, I think, is a little sluggish. I am a, was a little disappointed with eight. Nine is glorious. One of the all-time great Mahler nines. You get the, the Cook version of the tenth, with uh, Berlin Radio, which is absolutely fantastic. And I wish, I wish, if they had thrown into this box all the other Mahler he did, I mean, that phenomenal Das Knob and Wunderhorn, and he did a really fine Das Klag in the lead, boy, this would be a box for the ages. But as it stands, for the symphonies, I would, I would pick this one to start, just to get a really good sense of what's going on in all of them and what they sound like. But the fact, that, the fact is, if you're a Mahler collector or you want to be a Mahler collector and you want to sort of get yourself your bearings in Mahler symphonies and you can afford and have the time for multiple Mahler, Mahler cycles, get Chailly, get Gielen, get Bertini, get one or both of Bernstein's and you will be in great great shape as far as Mahler symphonies go. So I hope that this survey has given those of you who wanted it what you wanted. That is an overview of Mahler symphonies in boxes. I still believe that we are better off getting, well, nowadays getting individual performances. But, but you know, unless you're doing digital downloads, it may be that you can't anymore. Because all this stuff, as you can see, from these piles of things I have sitting here has been boxed up and maybe that's the way to get it. And I also have to say, I did a little research before I did this talk on pricing and these things are fantastically inexpensive. You can now get your Mahler cycle, the really good ones, for between 30 and $40. And we're talking 12 CDs routinely. That's one hell of a deal. 
So you can afford to get a couple and give it a shot. But some of these, like Shai is more expensive, Gielin is more expensive, but you can get very fine Mahler cycles very inexpensively. And so you may have the opportunity to get one or more of these and find your own path. So keep on listening, folks. Thanks for joining me. Take care.